Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast of the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson, and I am excited about this podcast with you today. I met Akira Nakano through various fabulous VR people, virtual reality folks, but this is about music education and about composition and about virtual reality. He runs the Los Angeles Inception Orchestra, and when you finish listening to this, you'll go, wow, how could I rethink learning and rethink education and take my program globally in one fell swoop. So please enjoy this conversation. At the end, we'll share how you can reach out and connect with his organization and perhaps bring this way of teaching composition, teaching locally, engaging your local artist community, become instructors, and how to teach and explore screen-based creative learning with kids that might be ages 11 to 18 around the world. So please enjoy, please reach out, and thank you for listening this week. So when we were introduced and started talking, my 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 brain lit up. Can you share with our audience what what you do and how you frame it and then I'll back up into how you got there. Sure. So we at the Los Angeles Inception Orchestra are really not an orchestra. We are attempting to innovate music education through original composition and virtual reality. Um, Most kids, especially in underrepresented areas, they don't have access to the symphony hall or music studios. In fact, my mom used to teach in East LA and she made it a point to take all of her students to the LA Phil or to the opera just to give them the experience. Um, You know, their, their parents, they don't, they are working three or four jobs just to put food on the table. So they don't have the money to take the kids out into culture. They don't have the money to support them in in additional arts education, which maybe is not being provided. So one of our goals is to really use the VR platform to introduce kids to the symphony hall, classical music, the orchestra, uh, and recording studios, but through original composition done by their peers, people who are in high school, junior high school, um, so that when they look at these VR things that we will eventually end up, we're in the middle of producing, um, they will get to see kids who are just like them, who are creating, they get to see their creative process, they get to see the pluses and the minuses, they get to see them interact with all these professional musicians from out uh, from throughout Los Angeles. And so they can see someone who looks like them and says, oh, they have the same issue that we do and that's great and they can relate. Or better, they see someone who doesn't look like them and they can say, oh, that's really amazing. You know, they also have the same things. So thinking of then the block and tackle of it, you're using Oculus, you're using HTC, or you're using a variety of of consumer grade stuff. So someone could, could do this. I mean, we started talking before the current pandemic and now we're in the pandemic where if somebody has some of the stuff at home are they needing to buy unique equipment to do this so could I, i'm thinking ahead in our conversation about teleportation about bringing this to people's individual houses but so you're using regular consumer grade stuff yeah so actually what is happening is that we've paired with a great organization um Zaw studios and they have a team called beyond the influence and um i was actually although i'm supposed to be filming and turning the camera on in the middle of our sessions i've been very clear that this is a music education program first and the vr comes after the vr people have come in and taken over and it's great um but the plan really is is to once we have this app created um is to take this into schools using the oculus well we'll just take a few oculus goes with this so kids can use it but then the real take home for them is uh is their phone so the app becomes available also on their phone so we leave the leave behind as a cardboard so that they can also just go play around with it explore share it with their families uh because in most areas, people do have a phone. Kids have phones that they can look at um, so that they don't need to take the, you know, they don't need to have a VR to use, uh, you know, a viewer to use it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, you know, the, uh, the, with our first, with us for VR is that VR is not the end all thing that we're trying to do. We are hoping that once we t- 
have kids look at these VR things and be inspired and want to be creative or play music, we have partnered with organizations and we have places to send them. So if some seven-year-old sees this and says, I want to play the violin, we have a program that's scholarship that we can refer them to so they can go pursue the violin for free. And that was a really important part of what we're doing. So I'm going to back up into the basics. And so I am, I am uh, a wonderful 12 year old kid who finds your program. I'm going to come in before the whole COVID-19 craziness. We're now recording this in, in April of 2020. I would come to something in Los Angeles and get instruction in music composition live. Yes. So it's twofold. First, we have composers who come in all from across Los Angeles, all with different levels of experience. And we are, we have created a music composition mentoring program with um, both composers and musicians who come in and teach their instrument, teach composition. We really are trying to get the kids to be creative, uh, to get out of the box of the traditional, uh, the traditional training. So if they're, you know, classical pianists, um, a lot of really, really talented classical pianists, they don't necessarily know how to break free of, of how to play and how to create. And so we really try to teach them how to um, think out of the box. You know, if they're playing Twinkle Twinkle on the piano, like by Mozart, um, mentors come along like me and I just bang on the piano uh, and try to get them to just shake it up, go to the other side of the keyboard and play backwards. Um, we also do things where we we have instruments around the studio and we just say, pick something you don't play and create something on that uh, and still try to make a song and communicate. I think um, we really come at it from not a theoretical point of view. We really tr want to come at it creatively. Um, how do you tell a story? How, you know, how are you emotionally in that moment? And then we can come back and say, oh, that happens to be the A, B, A, C, A structure of a song, um, but you've done it from a storytelling point of view. The kids' compositions, they learn about every single instrument of the orchestra uh, week by week. Uh, someone different comes in and introduces, how do you play it traditionally? How do you make crazy sounds with it? Um, what do you do in session? That could be amazing. And then the kids, over the course of the program, they write a big old song um, that gets performed by the mentors. This year, we want to have full orchestra playing their pieces uh, when we get to the end of their program. And all along the way, we are then filming their journeys in VR to release on an app that we can then take around to schools all over the area. Excellent. Sort of thinking this through, again, my brain keeps going pre-COVID-19, post-COVID-19, and this will be listened to into the future, that this was a very high-touch experience. Yes, and I can, I, I can address that. Yeah, well, I, but also in terms of economics. I'm an ex-banker, so I tend to think, wow, I mean, the, the student-to-teacher ratio, I'm assuming, was really small, is really small. Yeah, that ratio is really small. Uh, the student to teacher ratio is really small. We we worked this year to upscale, so we partnered with a couple of organizations. One of them that was amazing was the Asia America Symphony Association, led by David Benoit. Um, so he had they pitched out our program, um, and we had several kids and then their friends come and join. Um, and then also one of the instructors from Harmony Project, he also referred a couple of his kids. So. Um, but the ratio is very, very, you know, it's, it's, it's mentor heavy, but, um, a lot of the mentors are donating their salary back. Um, so that we do pay them, we do have a deal with the union, but that way, um, we don't have to, it's, it's not fully that. And I think that, um, I, I think that helps us quite a bit. Um, we have one mentor come in every, um, every other week. Uh, in full studio session. And then on the off weeks, then each kid gets on in a private session. And to save money, that tends to be me. And I don't collect a salary for that. Um, however, this year with the kids who had me last year, they are getting new mentors who they're working with. And those mentors have been very gracious about the amount they're charging for that. And the scalability comes from the shareability with Google Cardboard on their phone so they can be inspired or, or is the part of the scalability that this could then become a train-the-trainer program? 
it can become a train the trainer program. Um, one thing that we found that's really interesting is actually scalability has, we've now gone national just by virtue of, um, because we're in April 2020 and in the middle of COVID, um, we've had to go all digital, um, which has actually been okay for, it's been okay for the group classes, except for the improv, the group improv session. So we've had to work around that a little bit, but we found some um, very, uh, very strategic and good things that have worked out for the kids by using Zoom rooms and letting them pair up and create something and then come back. Um, and then the mentors do that. But what's that has allowed us to do is actually to go national, um, just completely separate from this. I mean, I, I'm on lessons.com. And so I had a kid from Austin, Texas reach out who wanted lessons in composition. And so he's going to be um, joining completely by Zoom. And even when we go back into the studio, I think because of the COVID crisis, I don't want to be responsible for deciding whether or not um, parents are comfortable letting their kids come. So we started last year actually just putting on our Zoom in the middle of the session anyway. So kids who were like sick or out could participate. So it'll be the same thing. So anybody nationally can participate um, by Zoom. And so for our kid in Austin, we're actually through your um, great um, conference that you just had, Amplify Music, um, I've networked with somebody in Austin to help find some of the same experiences that we're giving our kids, like are there any studio sessions that he could go to and observe um, so that it's local for him. So um, that's, how we, that's how we go out and expand. Excellent. How, what's the age range that this is designed for? Because I'd like to take this myself. Um, the age range, the composers this year range from 11 through 18. Oh, um, I'm too old. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I keep thinking, I mean, I was, when I was that age, I was playing stereotypical uh, clarinet in a regular band and had a amazing and I think now passed away um, uh, teacher who was a jazz trumpeter. And so he actually made us learn composition improv, which definitely is not in your normal, well, at least my experience, my own kids experience, not your normal uh, middle school, high school curriculum. So you're, you're really stepping outside of what is average for what's offered for kids in school right now. Yes. Well, you know, composition is on the standards for the California, the state of California's education standards, but it's not necessarily taught. And so when we first decided to form um, the nonprofit, we really reached out um, to people and people were asking us, what are you doing that's different? And we checked with organizations who are there are so many nonprofits in Los Angeles who are doing music education well, but they're doing instruments. They're doing exactly what you said, traditional violin instruction. And so some of the nonprofits are saying we're graduating kids to college, but they are behind in composition and music theory, way behind because they don't have that. These other nonprofits don't have that. So here was a lane that we got to fill in the gaps for and be relevant. And Can I back you up further then? So yes. you're a UCLA grad. Yes. How did... How did your journey start and how did you end up in this space and, and, and what's your own origin story with this? I'm not thinking like superhero origin story. Well, that could be too. So you started as a classical pianist? I did start as a classical pianist. I was in LA. I went to the Colburn School all the way through my childhood. Um, I got into UCLA on a full ride piano performance scholarship. And after six weeks, I left the music major. Um, wah, wah. Why? While I, I just needed something else. I needed to explore something else. I graduated UCLA with a film degree. Um, and But in the meantime, uh, while I was still at UCLA proper, I went to the UCLA Extensions Film Scoring Program, which is mm. a lot of where we got our ideas from for this program because it was not taught out of a textbook. It was very experiential. We had lots of instrumentalists come in and play our works. And this is a, you know, kind of a formula of that. And boy, did I wish when I was younger, I had th that type of experience because here we are now giving high school kids that experience of being in a professional rehearsal, working with professional musicians. Um, one of our mentors is June Kudamoto from the band Hiroshima. And of course she is our 
really our true jazz mentor who's talking about working with Miles Davis. And she was super lovely and she donated her salary back. And Hiroshima happened to have been invited on their um, to the Hollywood Bowl. They were on their 40 year anniversary tour. And so two weeks prior to the concert, she is talking about like, you know, she doesn't play the koto like traditional koto. She sometimes plays it like an electric guitar. And the kids kind of nodded their head in session and thought, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then, of course, she does it two weeks later in front of 18,000 people. And literally you look over and the kids' mouths drop open um, because it was so incredible and such a great arc for them to have. Um, so it, it's, it, I was going to say that it's interesting that, that we get such stereotypical views of what is possible in music whether it's from traditional media or large scale concerts that oftentimes adults and students can't see kind of an increased surface area of what else is possible career wise, creation wise, et cetera. It sounds like you guys are, are, are making good action, good activities with that to help students really rethink what is possible. Well, we're really trying that. And this year we are working on, fully expanding what we're offering within the program. We've paired with a great organization called Thai A, led by Dr. Melvin Armstrong um, out of um, Cal State LA. And he has been just super generous. And he has said, every one of your composers needs to be, uh, needs to have access to proper college prep. We need, they need help fi finding scholarships. So that's really a great thing that we're able to offer them. But then the kids kind of get stuck in this, thing of like, well, what if my music career can't go? And so we're also making sure that this year we're bringing in people who have careers throughout the music industry, music supervisors, audio recorders, producers, so that they know that there are a variety of different careers that they can also go into um, so that it's not uh, it's not limited to what if this one thing doesn't work. And in the, same t in the same vein, we're really encouraging them because we are bringing in this high ratio of mentors to kids. I mean, basically we're two mentors to one kid, right? We have 20 mentors and 10 composers, although that number is supposed to grow uh, composer-wise. Um, but I'm making sure that the mentors, and the mentors have all agreed to this very graciously, to be network resources to all these composers to keep in touch. I mean, how many kids get to apply to college and say, I've worked with all these people in the industry. Um, and what's great is that they have different, the mentors come from different places. So if the kids are thinking of going to Berkeley, they have someone who they've worked with who can help them out there. Someone at UCLA is one of the faculty, someone at USC. So it's really, it's, it's to not only just open their minds so that they have this creative, um, this creative experience in music, which I personally have been trained, you know, through Colburn. And I know that was something that was a little bit missing um, that could have really broadened my, my vision of what could have been a music, a, a, a better music career for me. Um, so we're trying to do this younger and we're trying to do it better. And this is though, though you say orchestra, in your label, you have a wide variety of instrumentations and cultures represented and not single genre activities. Well, what's really funny is I think it started, so the whole thing really started because I wanted to do a concert. Um, I'm a, you know, I came back and I'm a good classical pianist. Um, but immediately when at our first board meeting, we talked about music education and when it becomes about not you, it becomes important. And so although there's the orchestra label on it, the orchestra is a pickup group that we will hire. We are a um, young composers mentoring program. That's what we are. Eventually, we will drop to Los Angeles and just become the Inception Orchestra. Um, but it's important that we really are, you know, all about the original composition aspect of it. And in fact, one of our people early on said it's really important that we are a creative practice based in composition and that's what our main mission on the music side is film and film composing so that was your doorway one of your many doorways so uh most of our guests on this podcast have walked down many halls to get to the one that they are in now and usually have a massive overlap that coincides with the opportunity so it sounds like you've got classical piano you've got film composition you have the ucla film program for that and then you've got a technology background. How does the 
How did you end up wandering in the the VR realm of this part of it? Well, so I was a video editor. I got a job right out of high school, and it was a um, I was a video editor for twelve and a half years, concurrent with going to UCLA, and then um, beyond that um, before going into you know indie film and plays and stuff. Um, VR. What's interesting how we came how we fell into VR was. Um, I worked at Gensler as I, I have been an executive assistant as a day job sometimes to support my music career. And Gensler, which is the biggest architecture firm in the world, um, there was a man there um, named Alan Robles, who unfortunately just recently passed away. Um, but he was kind of a visionary in in the VR space in architecture. And that's sort of how I started to become really aware of it. Um, his colleague, Megan Luboska, now sits on our board. And interestingly, VR and architecture is um, is really innovative because what they're doing is they are thinking not tomorrow, but like eight years ahead and helping clients envision what their space is going to be, how it's going to be used, but all through this use of, of the virtual reality. Well, it's kind of pre-visualization like you'd yes. have in film, but you're yes. pre-visualizing a really expensive object. In for sales and finance and design and all that fun stuff. Well, and I know I there's a major basketball player that they were working with and they were designing his office and they were able to use VR to have him look around the space and you know he was able to say, oh, there's not going to be room for my kids to work and all this. So that part of it helped. But from that, um, Alan also gave great lectures on education in VR and um, – it, it became pretty clear to us that the VR space would be able to help us really get in and, and teach kids. We had met with uh, Mark Slavkin, Slavkin at the um, oh, Annenberg. Mark and I went to college together. <laughs> oh, nice. And he was, but he was really saying that um, music education needed a boost. It needed a change. And within the VR space, what they know, there's research that says, you know, if you are just listening to records and off books, you the kids' retention is like 20%. If you go in and play the piano, it's like 40%. But in a virtual reality space, there are studies that have shown that it, there's 90% retention because the kids fully are in, you know, in the space that they, there's no distraction, there's no phone. Um, you know, they can look around, they can experience you know, they can experience everything there. And so that just became something that this could really be an educational tool. Well, also, VR memories come to people as real memories. Yes. And um, so that's why, you know, there was a big discussion about, is it, are we going to do VR or AR? But, you know, we decided it's it's all VR um, because you could take them and put them somewhere. Um, our, the thing that we used to pitch before we even got, going was the Lion King, the musical on Broadway had did their first five minutes in 360 VR. And it's the most incredible experience. And so by not only filming on stage, you see the audience, but they also add little um, information um, graphics to it. And so we're trying to put those things in and um, to what we're filming as well. So that if, for example, if we start on stage of our show and kids want to then learn about the cello, then there's like a cello thing that pops out and then they can learn all about the cello from the cello mentor. So that's what we're putting together right now. How are you funding this extravaganza? Right now, it's all family and friends um, who have been very, very great, gracious. Um, we're working a lot of grants. Um, uh, that was kind of our big push when between our break between our first program and the current program. So um, our director of development is doing a great job, Wendy Chung, um, helping us apply for things. Um, but our VR portion through Zaw Studios is coming in kind, uh, which is really amazing. So um, they reach out and they help lots of lots of nonprofits throughout LA, you know, with their mission. But Adrian came on board with his team and just said, we hear you. This is super exciting. What can we do? And all of a sudden we had crews popping up at our, you know, at our sessions and at our rehearsals and for the concert and content was just suddenly available for us. Um, and that part of it is really amazing. And I don't think that, especially as a nonprofit, you get by and create things without great support from partners who just help you. 
one of the interesting things right now is that even if you thought you were doing X, you're now doing Y, right? So I know people who were really worried for their nonprofit, their regular job four months ago about the mundane and the the pedantic, that they were worried about whether XYZ client was going to come in and then their backup plan was maybe one other client and they were totally focused on what that was or that they were planning on some creative gig that now has gone the way of the dinosaur. How does all of this current, you mentioned that you now suddenly have gone online and global. How has the current pandemic, and again, people will be listening to this later and we'll have a little bit more uh, uh, retroactive thinking about this, but how has this transformed the opportunity? And especially now you have so many kids in schools who are having to think about learning, living, and creating remotely. Well, what I think about this current pandemic situation is actually because we had this new cohort of, cohort of kids who are younger, um, kids who are young like screens. And so I think it actually took some of the maybe initial intimidation away that might have been there from having to walk into a studio fresh and meet new people. And so it's made everyone real comfortable um, earlier on. So then when we finally do meet as a group, everyone will know each other. Um, screen time, and I have two young nephews who are 10 and 14. I mean, they love screen time. These kids are amazingly great at the technology. It's, it's actually very fun because we're making them all um, use Sibelius, which is the music notation software. And so the kids discovering um, how to use Sibelius, it, it's so exciting because they, of course, pick it up super fast. I mean, there are kids who are better at it than me, and I've been using it for a long time. We had one kid who actually just kind of randomly um, started clicking notes over across the whole score and then played it back and it ended up actually being fantastic. And so he used that as his as his base for his his initial uh, motif for his song. And it's it's really hilarious just by exploration. Um, I think a good lesson also for educators, I know that I've been on some conferences and educators at schools were really concerned about their professors not getting the tech right away and that being slow. But my suggestion has always been, you know, have the kids help you and set it up for you because the kids understand it like really, really well, so. And this has been something that high schools who've had blended learning have known for a decade or more is that their kids are the best tech support for each other and the students, I mean, for the faculty. And now that we're suddenly, uh, for many people, shifted, that people who had not shifted aren't necessarily comfortable not being the expert and letting the kids actually help and run the show. So, Right. And, you know, I think for me, I, as, an, uh, as an adult, I mean, I think um, I've always loved learning. And I think, um, you know, when I left the music major, I took a little bit of break from piano and I, I came back to it as an adult several years later. And I had to understand that I had had a high school education, but it was really important and exciting to keep learning and keep exploring. And I think for, for us as an adult to keep learning from kids is super exciting. I, I love that part of this process is that we are not only imparting the wisdom that we have, but we also get to learn from them as well. We are already near the end of this conversation. We probably could talk two or three more times and might be a good idea to do so as you continue to grow this out. Is there anything else you'd want to share with our at home and later studio audiences? Uh, things that we haven't talked about that are important to you and your program? Well, I think one thing that is really great, and especially in these times, is that I love that we are reaching across all ethnicities. Um, we're reaching out to kids and that music really doesn't, music is one of those things that allows you to just be with anybody. And I think that's how we should live our lives. I think we try to have the kids do that as well. So um, I know there are certain thoughts in these current times and I'm hoping that we can use music to just, you know, love and create. And I think not only kids, but adults, I think it's a perfect opportunity right now in COVID to create things that are beautiful and, um, and really explore that time. And that's, that's one thing that I want us to do. And I, and I hope everybody um, just has that opportunity to, to use music in its best of forms. 
Well, I'm very proud to have had you on here as an innovator. I'm glad that you could come and get something out of the Amplify Music event we just did, which by the time people hear this, the audio should be also coming out both on YouTube and on this podcast. So we'll be able to share some of the other innovations going on in music education in this time. Uh, If someone wants to reach out to you, though, how should they do that? Thank you. Um, They can reach me directly at Acura at InceptionOrchestra.org. And our website is InceptionOrchestra.org. You know, I'm I would love to have you. We'd love to have more composers. Um, We're trying to set up some some forums. We've already done one um, for adults where they get to intersect with some of our mentors as well. Uh, just in this time. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you and we'd love to have more kids. Excellent. And so if someone wants to contribute money, of course, that's welcome as well. Of course. And if they'd like to bring this to their local community, school districts, that's also a great conversation. Absolutely. We are really, we are currently really thinking about how to port it to other cities. Um, and you can hire, you know, use your local talent base to, to create this program over there as well. Um, so we're happy to help you with that. Excellent. Thank you for coming on the show. Gigi, thank you so much for the opportunity. 